Uh, our next panel on visions for the future are people who are doing some pretty interesting stuff on this waterfront. Uh, our previous panel, of course, was also doing interesting stuff, but uh, not so much the uh, multi-generational family organizations that we heard earlier, but people who are doing some pretty cutting edge things on our waterfront. And uh, so that they have adequate time to speak, I'm gonna just introduce them by title, and in their presentation, they will go through what they're doing, so you'll hear everything. Uh, Dan Adams is the founder of Landing Studio. You're gonna see a lot of what Landing Studio does. Andrew Jay is the president of the Massachusetts Oyster Project for Clean Water. Before he started that, he was also a dentist, he's not a businessman. And Mimi Love, the principal of UTO Architecture and Planning. And for those of you who were at the dedication of the Boston Harbor Island Pavilion on the Rose Kennedy Greenway, she's going to tell you her role in this. We're going to go in alpha order as well, so we'll start with Dan. We're going to try to leave you a little bit of time, ask a few questions, just uh, as follow-up, then we're going to do an open mic session, which is going to be facilitated by Gene Richardson from Boston Water and Sewer Commission before Cairo Shed, Boston City Planner, does his reflection wrap-up, and then we'll have uh, lunch after that. So, okay, Dan. Yes. Is that working? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I'm Dan Adams. We've seen a lot of landscapes, I'll show you a bit of landscapes. So this is Eastern Salt Companies, which is an operation that myself and my partner work quite a bit with. It's located in Chelsea, Massachusetts. It's a salt dock. This is actually a, a photograph from the first time that I had ever gone uh, to the landscape. Uh, as a landscape designer and an urban designer and an architect, I, was, I just thought it was really beautiful. Uh, very fascinating, very interesting, and I've basically been spending the last six years finding out more about it and uh, working with it. Um, so I think where this is quite relevant here is that this is a very maritime industrial operation. Um, one of the larger operators, uh, specifically privately owned operators in the Boston Harbor region. You see a ship being unloaded here. And I think part of what makes this really interesting is that it's located in Chelsea, Massachusetts, which is a 1.8 square mile, not like the other cities we've seen so far today, very tiny, very little, small, very interesting community north of Boston. And you see here the breakdown of residential in the gray and industrial zone areas in the black. <coughs> sort of a 50 50 zone. And I think some of what's interesting about this is its proximity with Boston Harbor, which is obviously very significant infrastructure, in this case, the Federal Navigation Channel. So, what you start to see is this kind of dynamic of a very small community interrelating with very large infrastructure. <coughs> And I think we've talked a lot about sort of the history of industry and communities. It's often referred to as leaving or I mean, even disappearing or something. I always think that's a little odd. It sort of just moved or <laughs> shifted. <coughs> Unlike New York, where it kind of moved further out, in the case of Boston, it's actually moved further up and in. In this case, coming into communities like Chelsea, Everett, East Boston, Charlestown. So you see just through the designated port area, kind of the relative densities and locations of large scale maritime industry. And you see Chelsea uh, is a critical player in these industries. So for a lot of the community, this can become easily perceived as sort of an industrial wall or a barrier to a lot of the types of landscapes that uh, we're starting to appreciate in other communities. It, it also, I think, this is a great photograph, right? I think just showing that kind of intersection of scales, right? A relatively small uh, urban environment intersecting with a fairly significant industrial moment. And so from my uh, interest as a designer, I'm intrigued about how to design this intersection. Uh, and so what you see here is a, a self unloader, uh, the McArdle drawbridge, and just how this reverberates into community and how a, a community relates with this. So in this case, you see uh, quite frequently, particularly in the winter for home heating oil and salt, uh, the bridge goes up, it reverberates for the city in one way, which is uh, traffic. But, and that can obviously be seen as a negative for people in the community. Uh, I think what you see here is actually, I, I like this moment quite a bit, is people kind of in the know from Chelsea often get out of their car, spend five, ten minutes, depending on how long it takes, just sort of watching the maritime operations, watching the ships go by. For me, uh, if I was on a meeting, I wouldn't like it. On my way to a meeting, it would be a, a downer. But otherwise, it's sort of an interesting kind of moment where everyone takes a pause and kind of hangs out, in this case, watching the salt operations. And so I think we've seen a lot of sort of conversation about these sort of park developments and different landscapes and they're beautiful and these are some examples from Manhattan from a project we were looking at recently where 
I think what we're seeing is this sort of trend where uh, infrastructures, which were very robust, built in fact for the sustainability of transit in a region, the efficiency of a region, uh, are in many ways being sort of stripped of those functions over time. These are all uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn on the right. Um, and then being replaced by sort of park infrastructures, which are unbelievable parks, really beautiful landscapes. Um, and I think where it becomes interesting from a design perspective is the question, is it possible to preserve some of the sort of transit efficiency, the transport efficiencies of these landscapes in conjunction with the public benefits? And are there ways to integrate these industrial and uh, infrastructural uh, value with public value, community value? This is something we call plural infrastructure. So can we start overlapping functions in the landscape? So this is actually the salt dock in Staten Island, New York, very similar operation. This is the same salt dock in Staten Island. And what I think is interesting, I guess I like these kind of, you know, can you get a kid with cotton candy standing next to a Panamax in a salt pile? In fact, you can. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, I think, it's an interesting slide. This is sort of the arrival of salt into Boston Harbor. So it was built in South Korea, owned by a company in Greece, registered in the Marshall Islands, piloted by a crew from the Philippines. It arrived in Boston a week ago full of salt from Egypt, it was on its way to Mexico. That's a fairly amazing moment for a city, this sort of global convergence, right? And so, and these landscapes are not placeless, you know, foreign things. Their salt is evaporated from ocean water in places like Mexico and Australia. This is the Atacama Desert in Chile, famous for copper mining and solar mining, where they do open pit surface mining to remove the salt. And this is Northern Ireland, where the salt is mined from about a thousand feet underground. And all that salt comes here to Boston, it comes to New York, it's along the East Coast. And you can see it becomes quite close to communities. And I think what's interesting is when it comes from these various locations, it even bears a trace from where it came. Right? So here you're seeing what I call a salt stratigraphy. Over the course of a year, you can see all the nations played out on your shores. You just need to know a little bit about them. I always like it, it's maybe bad stereotypes, but Northern Ireland is always kind of dirt <laughs> and ground, like the earth. Egypt has a sand in it, which is interesting. Mexico is hot, it's evaporated from the ocean directly, so it's a pure crystalline white. And from an urban perspective, I've got, again, as a designer, this is just amazing, beautiful, and fascinating. You know, in the summer, or when they're low on salt, you have the open views. Uh, you know, 12 hours later, a self unloading Panamax is discharged salt, so you now have a Mexican white salt horizon. Maybe you go to work the next morning, maybe you come home after a Northern Irish salt has been delivered. <coughs> and then maybe in the summer it's covered, and then it's opened again. So it's a constant kinetic landscape. So as a designer, you know, how can we capitalize on this? How can we start animating and even sort of playing with these landscapes to make it a bit more part of the community, make it a plural infrastructure, serving industry, serving the community? So this was actually our first project with the salt landscape, which we did as students uh, in the design school. Uh, we had this sort of idea of let's do some cool projections on the salt piles, constantly changing. What's the way we can kind of map these projections, uh, these sort of changing landscape? We wanted, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist Jenny Holzer, these poems that they project on landscape. She did one on the ICA not long ago. We were going to do these great poems. And then uh, the, the Red Sox made it to the World Series <laughs> in 2004. And the company said, we're not going to do any of that. You're going to put Go Sox on the file. I'm very excited about that. Which was very fortuitous because then over the course of the next year, we did these very everyday statements on the salt pile. Christmas carols at Christmas time. Um, and you can see here what's cool is because the light is so flexible and malleable as they carve away the salt, the text changes, and you can even sort of see the change in the landscape. You know, again, sort of later Christmas time, like in cross salt pile, when it was uh, November elections that year and the presidential elections of a reminder to the community, the <coughs> society, high school graduation of the Red Devils, springtime. And you can see I, we quite like that even in a late snowstorm, they started carving away the salt, so the text completely disappears and you can see the salt on the roads. And I think um, what was really kind of cool with us about that, that we liked quite a bit, was by the end of this year of projections, people were starting to even call us from the community, oh, I'd like to make a wedding announcement on the salt pile. Oh, I'd like to advertise my business on the salt pile. I would like, I like the wedding announcement quite a bit. We didn't do it because it was right after, unfortunately, uh, that would have been just fun. But the idea that something so foreign, something so global could become part of the local community started being this idea like, well, this is a public landscape. It doesn't just have to be a park. It can serve the functions of the community, it can serve the functions of the neighborhood. 
I, I want to say, I, I skipped over, but like when you see something like the High Line in New York, that was an old freight line that served businesses in New York, right? And so it's, it's an awesome park, the West Cofidio, it's, you know, field operations, it's one of the greatest parks of the last century, right? But yeah, I think you have to ask, that used to serve the community with rail, very efficient transit, and now that rail doesn't exist, so everything's on trucks. So that's a little less efficient, that's less sustainable. And so the question is, is there a way to start balancing these things? And in particular, maritime transit is <coughs> by far the most efficient. So again, we're back with the ships. So another question is, this is an opportunity of scale. We bring something very big into the community, different than what we find on some of the landscapes around here. It's so big. These carry 50,000 tons of salt per ship. So the equivalent landscape is very big. Uh, what you can see here is the salt pile kind of finishing up for the season. They clear the dock, they open it for these festivals. So Chelsea Mass has been hosting festivals for 2005, essentially capitalizing on the size of their landscape to have events with 10,000 plus people on them, which is fairly rare. And it's a very simple equation. They consolidate the salt to a portion of the dock, cover it, and open up the piece of the landscape for uh, access by the community. Again, what's so interesting there is once you start doing this as a tradition year after year, you start getting contacted by different groups who want to come and perform on your dock, right? That they start taking ownership of the landscape in your community. So we have thousands of people on the dock, diverse people from different backgrounds. And what I find amazing is the, uh, the fact that we have this massive infrastructure that can accommodate great vessels. We can accommodate all sorts of interesting things. We do helicopter demonstrations. We have the Coast Guard coming. Coast Guard ships, the problem is they're so little, they're actually hard to take. We have the helicopter demonstration, the water. And this is an example where like the, uh, the school, actually I think this is the Boston Harbor Association auction prize that the company often gets and donates to the community. Uh, we have teacher appreciation cruises. We have high school proms leave from the dock. Um, and they all come down to the dock, they cross the barge, they go under the crane, they get on a vessel, and they take towards the harbor. Senior bingo every summer on the dock. We have a lot of movie shoots on the dock. This didn't happen for real. It's just none of the lawyers are here, but that didn't actually happen. <laughs> <laughs> movie scene. <laughs> that would be bad. Donnie Wahlberg on the dock, new kid on the dock. It's funny. And Lady Gaga. <laughs> that was great. That was cool. <laughs> and this was an event. This is an event I want to show in particular because I'd like to work with the Harbor Association bring to Boston. We did this in Staten Island uh, last summer. Um, this is the Lumen Film Festival that we had on the dock for performance and animation art. You can see, essentially, this is a former U.S. gypsum factory we were converting into a salt dock, and for one night we turned it into a sort of film festival. With all these very kinetic, huge-scale projections, performances of various sorts, illuminating the industrial infrastructure on the dock. We work with a container terminal, borrow containers to turn them into individual galleries on the dock. And then this was, it's cool, I, you know, all of a sudden you turn around and the artist looks like something on fire. It was very, <laughs> it's a very liberating landscape in a way. You can do all sorts of things. Uh, looking at other kinds of landscapes, we do a lot with the sort of, what we'll call sort of the edge landscapes. This is a service support yard. This was just as an experiment for some of our other plans. Are there ways to take some of these sort of, let's say, they're actually very valuable, very used landscapes. A lot of times what people see as abandoned or unused, in fact, is not. It's often serving a very specific function for the industry of a maintenance yard or a repair yard. But in the end, it doesn't look good, and we know that, and we're trying to think of ways to obviously improve that for a sort of in very robust planting strategies, very uh, low investment. But that can actually even start serving other functions. And those have, I think, been inspiring that as we're now working with people in the city, like the city manager, Jay Ash, and others, to start thinking about appropriate ways of developing architectures in these landscapes. So this is, for example, a small little business park that we're looking at, where you find pretty much all the waterfronts slope up to the neighborhood. So how can we capitalize even on that sloping relationship? The fact that the neighborhood even looks down always on the industries, because they're on the water and the neighborhood goes higher. Is it possible to develop a type of architecture where we bring the community over on one level and the industry under on another level and essentially create a sandwich where you can see here where the use of something like a green roof passing over warehousing and other types of industrial functions kind of blurs that boundary, creates an amenity resource for the landscape, sort of a green horizon for the community, but also uh, support for the industry. So I'll just close by talking about sort of our largest project. Um, this is what we call Eastern Salt Rock Chapel Marine and the port. The port is what you'll well, describe it. It's a publicly organized recreation territory, sort of a fusion of 
industry and community. This is, you can see the current salt operations, and to the right you see a former coastal oil, asphalt, and uh, home heating oil terminal that we are proposing to convert into a salt dock and shared public park. You see the kind of integration of the two landscapes here, where a portion of it will be used for further salt, and a portion of it will be used as a year-round public park landscape. I think some of what's been very interesting, this has been a five-year long negotiation with the community and with state agencies, and I think some of what's been really fascinating in this process is working with all the city officials, all the city representatives, to even come up with planning scenarios of how we'll store the salt in order to sort of minimize its impact in the summer months for blocking view corridors of the community and whatnot. Like, how can we actually stage the operations to be most uh, neighborly? So we've had all sorts of agreements with that. And I think where this is very complex of a project is trying to integrate the state sustainability mission of preserving efficient infrastructure and efficient transport while also accommodating the city's goals for public landscapes. It's one thing to sort of, I, I should give an anecdote that I always find very relevant is often I talk to people and I say, you know, we, uh, we design industries, you know, we design, uh, and people say, oh, that's great, you did like Escher Park or the Highline, and I say, no, no, that post industry, <laughs> we design actual living industries, and then almost inevitably the, the counterpoint after that is they say, oh, that's quite a niche. They say that's quite a niche, and I'm always a little like, that's sort of an odd statement for the design profession and for a lot of us now that we often think of industries as kind of relegated from the community. It's not something that's part of our community. It's not something that we design, where in reality, I think they're probably the most important thing to design. So here's the concept. We essentially partition the landscape, and actually even a portion of the public landscape will shift such that in the winter months it's used by the industry, and in the summer months it's used by the community. At first, we studied a number of types of events that the community is interested in using. Chelsea has so little public access to their waterfront that there's a lot of interest of ways to use even essentially a three-quarter acre parcel on weekends, produce market. <laughs> we had a lot of cynicism about this project. It's been very difficult. It's taken five years of negotiations, and we're just now getting to the home stretch of it. this. We started the remediation and cleanup of the oil tunnel. And part of where I'm particularly fascinated is even trying to preserve some of the heritage of this in the landscape itself. So we've been collecting in this process all the kind of relics and interesting artifacts of the landscape. This was actually part of phase one demolition. And how can those artifacts be converted? It very easily sandblasted, repainted, rebolted in the ground as new park landscape amenities as part of the salt park. I should emphasize that uh, you know this is not going to be a separate park. This is going to be a piece of the marine industrial operations. It's just a part of their landscape. They just make it accessible and usable by the community. The geodesic domes over the tanks were very fascinated in. You know, can we remove those, lower them to the ground, relocate them in this public access landscape? The design of the architecture, we're trying to preserve a number of the kind of pieces of the old uh, buildings. And then looking even at the nature of the secessional landscape that's been sort of taking root, and how that can then be conjoined with these industrial artifacts to become part of a new public landscape as part of this marine industrial park. Here you see the full summertime expansion. It's essentially the winter, the salt operations go relatively dormant in the summer. All this salt that you use is used for winter de-icing of our roadway. Thank you. Were they ever here? Nobody seemed to know the answers to those questions. So we began 
looking and seeing what we could do. So who we are, we're all volunteer. And it's really been interesting because whenever we've called out for volunteers through our email network or the website, we've never had a shortage of volunteers. People are always anxious to come to the water to help out, be it measuring oysters, counting oysters, spreading them down, supporting the divers. Um, and it's, it's really been fascinating. It's, there's never been a shortage of, of people and uh, of people who want to be a part of this. The other interesting piece about it is we've never had somebody say to us, no, I don't want oysters near me. Um, <laughs> generally, when I talk to a, a marina or an industrial area, people say, oh, we could use oysters. Uh, so for example, John Sullivan, who runs Boston Water and Sewer, he said to us, he said, boy, could we use you? Can you look into Chelsea Creek? So with oysters, we run into the opposite of NIMBYs. It's, I call them NIMBYs. It's fleas in my backyard. <laughs> People really do want to have the oysters. <coughs> now, just a little bit about the oysters. Uh, what we're releasing is the standard eastern oyster. Its range extends all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to Nova Scotia. Um, each one of these oysters can filter 30 gallons of water a day, with roughly a bathtub. So they really are amazing filtering creatures. And we've got a link on our website to a time lapse of a photograph of uh, a film of an oyster, of a tank with oysters in it. It goes from green to clear water in a matter of uh, a couple of hours. They really do are amazing filters. So what do they take out? They take out the phytoplankton, they take out the silt, which improves water clarity. Um, they also capture nitrogen. Nitrogen is an important pollutant. Uh, basically, it's contained in urine. And uh, we produce a lot of them. I think the average person produces about 12 pounds of nitrogen a year. Um, uh, they also pull out algae, bacteria, E. coli. So they really are excellent filters. And so the idea when we began this project is that what we could do is we could create a natural filtration mechanism that would augment the work of, of the MWRA and their, their uh, terrific work to date. So it would just be another tool to help the heart. What we've subsequently learned is that, and I'll show some slides of this shortly, is that an oyster reef also performs an important role in the health of the uh, ecosystem of a harbor or a bay. In that it's got all this rugosity, all these nip nooks and crannies, and in there you get all these other species. You get shrimp, you get crabs, you get eels, you get bait fish, you get lobsters, all seeking shelter in an oyster reef. And it's, it's wonderful with kids, because when I, when I have uh, interns or kids or a scout troop looking at the oysters with me, it's always, we pull up a, a crate or some trays of oysters, and it's always, wow, look what we found this stuff. And uh, it's, it's, it's magical seeing the kids when they go through this. And so if we can get the oysters, we get cleaner water, we get other species. And also, uh, if you have better, better ocean view, it's going to draw our sea life, and that's going to draw people. So what did we learn? Uh, we learned that oysters can survive in Boston Harbor. Uh, when we started this, people said, oysters can't live in Boston Harbor. Uh, we learned that oysters can grow. We haven't yet shown reproduction. We're hoping that we will this summer. Uh, but we're going to keep at it until we do. Uh, we've also learned that people care about it. Uh, people want to see our do well. Uh, and people want to be involved. And again, nobody said no. But I do think one thing that's interesting is that the harbor was so bad for so long that people don't really appreciate its potential. Uh, there are now, we have now lobsters off of Charlestown. Uh, it's, it's really coming back. And I think we're going to see this for the next 10 years, that we're going to see more and more fish coming into the harbor. We're going to see more and more activity uh, uh, in terms of new species coming back. Uh, and more excitement about that. Uh, I, but I don't think there's a mindset out there that, wow, we, this can really be here. That, this can be an exciting, vibrant ecosystem. So what have we seen? We've seen the lobsters are back. This is one of our volunteers the last week with a lobster that was in one of our trays of uh, oysters. Scallops are back. If you read a diving guide and you say, where can I dive for scallops in Massachusetts? It'll send you to go up to Gloucester. There's no mention of Boston Harbor. But I've talked to divers in Gloucester and the scallops are now back in Boston Harbor. And that's important because scallops are very particular about the water quality that they need. So we're making real progress. Oyster catchers are back. Um, now, oyster catchers don't actually eat young oysters, but they've got that name. 
But maybe they heard of our activity and they know the things we do. <laughs> Um, a couple of things about the harbor. Did you know that oysters were once present in huge numbers in the Charles and Mystic River? There were, the reefs were so big that on the Mystic they used to block shipping. Okay. Um, those oysters used to be this long, this big. Okay. Did you know there were once salmon in the rivers in Boston and in Boston Harbor? See, what's, we've forgotten so much about this harbor. When we began this project, even when we talked to officials at DMF, they didn't know if oysters were here at this point or where they were. So we've got a resource we don't know the potential of. And so what I would say, and just question us all about is, what else have we forgotten? What else, if we went back to the records of the Global Times, looked through some of those uh, letters and documents that are kept over at Harvard's <coughs> library, what would we find out about what else was there in Boston Harbor that we would forgotten about? As we look forward, you know, every time I go out on the harbor, I, I see tremendous opportunity. Uh, I love visiting the islands. How many people have been out to Spectacle Island? Most people have. If you haven't, go out there for a day. If you've got a young niece or nephew, it's a great trip. You say, oh, I've got Junior. What am I going to do with him? Take him up to Spectacle Island. You can run around. They've got a beach. It's beautiful. Um, Port Point Channel is getting more attention. The fishing is improving. It's getting better and better. And people want to do more and more on the harbor. But maybe you asked me to look forward a little bit in my talk, so now I'm going to move into that. Okay? Um, I think there's a few issues we should focus on. Quality. Water quality. I mean, we've seen the tremendous improvement we've gotten from improving water quality from A to B. Let's not be satisfied now. Let's have a goal of making it pristine. You set a goal of pristine, maybe we won't get to quite pristine, but we'll get closer. Uh, let's also see biologic diversity. How many species can we bring back? What can we bring back that's not here? It will, when we make it biologically diverse, maybe there could be, imagine a boat tour of just the wildlife of Boston Harbor. Wouldn't that be neat? Um, also, that we want to maximize the life that's in it, in terms of the quantity, the quantity of uh, fish, the quantity of, uh, of biomass in the ecosystem, be it eel grass, be it plants, be it fish, be it shellfish. And also, let's maximize the opportunity for people to get there. Just a few things to imagine. Imagine salmon lakes in the Charles and the Mystic. Imagine bald eagles nesting on the islands. You go up to Squam Lake, up in New Hampshire, they have tours. Let's go look at the bald eagles. They've got a place where they nest every year. People go out and follow them around and watch them and it draws tourists. What about puffins? I don't know if puffins could live in Boston Harbor. But I don't know if we're, if we're north enough. I don't think they can exist in Scotland. I know we've got some rocky islands in the outskirts. Is it worth a try? Could it be fun? I know that in Iceland, people go on tours for the day. Let's go look at the puffins. Um, oyster reefs. I have to get back to my oyster reefs. Um, what you can see here is there's a crab in the center that obviously really likes the oysters. He's dining on it there. Um, I'd point out that New York has a plan to develop 500 acres of oyster reef over the next 50 years. They're taking this very seriously. And I think we should too. I think we've got a lot of opportunity, not just with oysters, but throughout the wildlife and the biodiversity we can bring to the harbor. And I think that's going to benefit us all. So, you can be a part of this. I mean, I never dreamt I'd be up here um, when, when we were talking in the, in the street, in the neighborhood. But get involved in a harbor organization, write a letter to an elected official, visit the harbor islands, be part of it. In any one of the islands, I was on a log island last week uh, working at a food shelter. It was fascinating. They're, they're really neat to visit. And volunteer, because you can build the future, and it can be very exciting.
hear me? Hi, I'm Amy Love. I'm the principal at UTO. We are architects and planners, and our office is in downtown uh, Crossing here in Boston. And we were uh, commissioned uh, to do the Harbor Park Pavilion on the Greenway in the summer of 2008. So what I'm going to do today is, is explain the whole process because it wasn't a typical process for an ar architect. We didn't have a program, we didn't have, um, we knew where the site was, but we didn't have a defined site. Um, and all we were told is bring awareness to the islands, to, to the people of Boston. We need them to understand that they have this fantastic national resource out there, they have a network of 34 islands, um, it's, we need to get them to understand the proximity of the islands to the city and connect the greenway where the pavilion is located to the islands. So um, we had three objectives when we started. One was that the pavilion should create some type of shelter, um, create shade. It didn't necessarily have to be a building, but had to be a place. And a place in particular on the greenway. The greenway is, is definitely a network of paths that get you from place to place. But we wanted this pavilion to actually be a destination where you would go to on the greenway, start your journey, or find out about the possibilities out of the Boston Harbor. Um, and, the, and the third one was to introduce, obviously, the, the, um, the Boston Harbor and attract people to the various islands. So we didn't really start with an idea of what the building looked like or how it should necessarily operate. We really started with mapping what we call the, the user's journey. How do we get people interested in going to the islands? What do they actually need on the islands? How do we get them to come back to the islands was basically um, what we were looking for. So we worked with a firm called IDEO um, who are industrial designers, but they have various facets. And we really work with their human behavior department. Um, and we also work with Reed Hildebrand, the, the landscape architect. That was the core team. And, and what we did is we came up with four primary candidate, uh, uh, categories. One, we call it Excite, and we get people excited about the islands. How do we then engage them in the islands, which is two, give them the information they need to actually get out there. Um, when they're out there, what are the tools they need to actually explore? And uh, lastly, extend. How do we get them to come back over and over? It's not a one-time deal. So we came up with a series of, of, let's say, kit of parts. The elements that we need to get people the information um, uh, to, to get them on their journey. And so we came up first with basic information giving them access and information about the eight um, uh, islands you can get to by public transportation. And those came in the form of vertical panels um, that were two-sided. One we called literally the money shot, gave you an idea of, of you know, the character, topography of the island. And the other side being the didactic side of the panel, describing the activities, the history, the um, geography of each of the islands. This was all, these panels were then to be on a large scale map that people could actually walk on and engage. So that was the first piece. Next was a series of or two didactic large scale maps. One um, of the islands and the, the Boston Harbor, the other of the city of Boston, which you can see in the lower right hand corner. And these, we wanted them to be interactive and we really, um, wanted the rangers who would be, we knew would be at the pavilion to actively engage uh, their audience and give them more, more information. We ended up going with a very low-tech solution. Literally have these maps on glass panels where they can take dry erase markers and mark on them. And as um, programming changes on the island, they could actually go up and write um, different events happening on each of the islands. We wanted to actually also inform people about the boat schedule. The boat schedule can be quite daunting if you go online and try to pick your boat um, schedule. It, it, it's 
too much information. So we wanted to simplify the information <coughs> and relate it back to how people use mass transportation in the city. So we even suggested graphics that give you an idea of which boats go to which islands. Um, and wanted to introduce three LED signs that had the actual next three boats that would be leaving right there at the pavilion. So when you got there, you would immediately have the information to, to make a choice of where to go next. We even uh, got down to the details. We wanted to be able to sell tickets right there at the Harbor Island and sell um, service vending machine seemed to be something that the younger generation, I'm still kind of in between, I sometimes go to the movies and need to <laughs> go out to buy a ticket as a person, or I use the self-service ticket machine. So these uh, ticketing machines we thought were very important to address the way people operate um, and will operate in the future. There, we need to have a retail component because we wanted to capture the people who would not have a a pre-planned idea to go to the islands, but we wanted them to be able to say, huh, Spectacle Island, 15 minutes away, let me grab what I need and go. And so there's a retail component where we um, designed these day tripper kits where everything you needed from suntan lotion to band-aids to, to water bottles, etc. You don't really need band-aids, but it was uh, <laughs> just an idea. Uh, and then the tools you would actually need on the island. When we actually met with people, we called them extreme users, those who were completely, you know, <coughs> repeating fans of going to the islands, to the ex other extreme people who were completely averse to the islands. We wanted to understand what, what, what they needed and what they thought about the islands. Well, we found out there's a, what we call the Gilgans Island. In fact, people really were paranoid to get trapped on the island and miss the last boat and never come back. Um, so we came up with the idea, well, what if there is a text message that tells you when the last boat's coming 15 minutes before, so that it reduces that anxiety. So we talked about those kinds of ideas. And, and um, another idea was different um, walking tours by podcast. Could you find more information? There could be the history one, there could be the you know, geography one, etc. So again, coming up with a list of tools that people would need to, to engage the islands. And lastly, extend. How do we get people to come back? What do they need at the end of their destination to repeat the trip again? Could we give them more information even as they're on their boat? And so there are some scenarios where we talked about Again, podcast of giving people information about the skyline in Boston, etc. So with that, we had our kit of parts. And then we had to go to the site go to the kit of parts. Um, the site is parcel 14, which is, I don't have a pointer, but it's right on axis with Quincy Market and right along um, the center of that square, which we call the, the Wharf um, Plaza. Um, and then you have Marriott Longwood across the way. So there was three sites that we looked at. We were not um, the first uh, team to try building this pavilion. Uh, there was a previous process, and the, the preferred location was what was called site number one up on this diagram. And that was literally at the corner of, the, of State and Atlantic Street, um, which is here, as you can see the pavilion right there on the corner. Um, and for various reasons, we studied different options and ended up with moving the pavilion to what we call Site 3. And our interest in moving it to the center of Parcel 14 was to do two things, was to actively engage what we call the Wharf Plaza, because it's a large um, area of, of, of paving uh, that's reminiscent of one of the um, historic wharfs. But it didn't have a lot of activity, so we thought we could just slightly engage that area that would activate that plaza. We would also capture people coming from Quincy Market and give them a direct sight line of where you actually catch the boats. Um, so that simplifying and having a visual connection from the pavilion to the place where you actually dock onto the boats was very important for us. Um, and you can see here, these are really, really <coughs> Some of our early um, studies that's trying to cite the pavilion, and you can see one standing at Quincy Market on the left, and on the right, 
uh, standing at Christopher Columbus, Christopher Columbus Park looking back at Quincy Market. <coughs> and to address the landscape as well, um, Parcel 14 had great ambitions, I guess, for people um, <laughs> traversing through the site, and the amount of lawn to path was was equal such that it was probably the, best, the least utilized parcel. Um, so we wanted to create more lawn space to create, again, a place where people would want to come and sit on the lawn. Um, and so with that, you can see this is a site plan of the pavilion. Um, and it has, it was comprised of two roofs um, with two uh, kiosks underneath. Here are the kiosks. One we call a retail kiosk, which engages the wharf plaza, and the other is the information <coughs> kiosk, which is where the rangers um, primarily are stationed. They're both open air, so they're not really enclosed spaces. And then you can see in front of that is the large plots, the large map of uh, pavers on the ground with the exhibit panels. So what we wanted to create essentially was a shelter, an outdoor exhibit for really the rangers to have the tools they needed to engage people, tell them what's out there, what islands they can go to, what the characteristics are of the islands, or let people actually do that on their own. Um, and the, I, here are some renderings that show some of the elements that we then incorporated into the architecture, the large map panels um, and, and the uh, scheduling, et cetera. So lastly, the roof. We had two objectives for the roof. One was to create a shady spot, and the second was to get water off of the roof, because this is an architect's biggest problem, is to deal with water in some capacity. So simply, we didn't have any ideas of the symbolic form of the roof, and we didn't, the form came only from literally getting water from one roof to the other, then down into the ground. And so the best ma material that we um, came up with was concrete. Um, it was a, it's a port in place concrete structure. Uh, we did play with some of the geometries, and those two diagrams are showing having the lowest point of the roof be on axis for each of the roofs. Um, and then we ended up having the second roof shift to be a little bit more dynamic and have the water flow be continuous from one roof to the other, even um, not acknowledging the geometry shift of the second group to make it more dynamic. And so just a couple of images of also things we were thinking about urbanistically. We wanted to make sure that the pavilion would not in any way um, uh, be an object in front of the connection from Quincy Market to the former walk to the sea. Uh, but we wanted it to engage and almost frame uh, that connection. We certainly were very interested in the pavilion having a relationship with the archway at uh, Columbus Park, Christopher Columbus Park, and having a, a focus on, on the end of that, and then creating a sculptural element right on the Greenway itself. Um, and so you can just, um, a little bit more, this is probably more for architects, but we're so, we learned so much from building of the, of the uh, concrete roof. I'm going to just show you a few slides to show you the complexity of it. So this is a plan looking at one of the roofs, and what you'll see are the beams creating these lozenge-shaped elements. And there's a series of really ten beams, uh, but they create they create five uh, pairs of these oval shapes. And they're spaced such that they, that they support, the center part supports the, the concrete roof um, more evenly. And um, we had to do this in um, three-dimensional modeling so that we could communicate with our fabricators on how to actually fill the roof. And as we were drawing and figuring it out, and we worked with an excellent um, construction management team, Turner Special Projects. We were all in this together, had all of the bids in, and we started to really work on this, and they said, you know this has never been built before. And <laughs> we said, I know, but we're going to figure this out. 
And it was a really great process, and I have to just say that working with the Boston Harbor Islands Alliance and National Park Service, having such faith in us to, to actually uh, let us see this through. Um, and it's been a really fun process for us. But here you can see the steel first being put in place, and it has the, the studs that are welded on to further engage the concrete. Um, because it's poured in place, they literally have to build, they have to build a frame up in the area of where it's going to, the concrete roofs were poured. So in order to do that, they have to build a series of ribs, which you see the wood ribs here every 12 inches on center. Uh, and then they actually have to cover those ribs in what's going to be the formwork here. And then once the formwork is in place, we actually pour, put the rebars in place. Um, and there's a lot of science to this, the right slump of the concrete, the right spacing of all the rebar, et cetera. Because ultimately the roof, this is now where the form has all been stripped. Um, and in this image, it's actually being shored in the corners because they had to shore it for a little bit longer time just to make sure that the cantilever was um, set and, and ready to go. But the actual edges of the roof are only three and a half inches thick of concrete. So it's an incredibly thin, um, and but strong, it's not necessarily delicate, but structure. And so here you can see the ribs of the second roof, the second canopy. And where water comes out at the very end of the second canopy, the form was too extreme to be built out of ribs and plywood shaping it to that, to that um, extreme form. So you can see here, this is the formwork. It's built out of laminated pieces of wood carved out to make that, that form that you see at the end, um, which is there. And so it's done. We're all happy um, <laughs> with the outcome. And here's the final images of the concrete with the steel ribs <coughs> underneath. Here's a view of the exhibit panels, um, which illuminate at night. Um, and here you can see a night shot um, and one of the things I actually missed, and I don't have an image and I, I'm just noticing now, there are these large LED panels behind the large mount. So they're approximately 12 feet wide by 8 feet tall that um, are a low resolution LED screen and um, they're going to project different images. And in fact, starting tomorrow evening, we work with the decor of a museum and we were highlighting five or six different artists. Um, so. Uh, that have been selected to have videos going of their work at night. And so I'll just leave with this last thing. It's always good to go back and see if you've done <coughs> everything that you intended to do. And I'll say that we definitely, I think we, we you know, excite, check, engage, check, explore, because um, the Boston Harbor Island Alliance does such a great job with programming. I think they do an excellent job. Um, job of getting people to have different activities out to do out on the islands. So honestly, that should have a check. But the extent, I think there's still some focus, and I think there's Tom, I see you in the audience, there's still some work to do to get people to um, get back there. And I think it starts with your next big project, which is Penix. I mean, that's one big project that's happening out there. And so um, I think this is just the beginning of a whole series of, of projects that are going to happen out on the island. A lot of food for thought. We can take two questions and then we're going to go into the open mic session. So I'm going to ask that it be specific questions to this panel, not a common question. Okay, because we're going to actually then immediately go into the open mic where you can say whatever you need to say. That's a long question. So, there are no public restrooms there. Uh, our organization, the Boston Harbor Association of Tom, can answer as well. Um, Pushed very strongly for the public restrooms there. Uh, part of it was funding, part of it was also maintenance questions. So there are not public restrooms in this facility. As you know, nearby there are a number of facilities that do have public restrooms. The New England Aquarium, which as on the second floor, free public restrooms. 
Uh, the Marriott has just undergone a renovation. You'll be able to go back to those restrooms as well. Um, and also the Rose Community Greenway over time will, in other facilities, hopefully have restrooms. But uh, it is not Mimi's question. I will answer so that. I would, I would like to add, because I almost find it as, a, as almost a fun way, a compliment, because not that we try to hide what we do, but what people forget is that we're right over the tunnel. Um, and, you know, we couldn't really accommodate very much other than the foundation that these buildings sit on. We certainly didn't have depth. So underneath the actual ground of where the, the map papers are, we literally just have four feet before we get to the top of the tunnel. And we didn't have places for our infrastructure. And so it's really um, kind of amazing. <coughs> you know, that we were able to even build a structure. And I think this is why people uh, struggle with building structures on the group. It's not technically feasible. So accommodating restrooms was, was too difficult. I also know in talking with the Greenway that their interest is in providing um, restrooms on the periphery, on the edges of the Greenway, rather than on the center spine of, of the Greenway. So um, it was lot, lots of discussions were um, around that particular issue. And the next time you're there, the rangers are there. They have a pamphlet that lets you know where the closest uh, public facilities are. One other question? Yeah, I noticed that the roof is relatively flat. And it's set, you know, with the dips. And I was thinking, what will happen when the snow, a lot of snow gets on there, and it melts, and then the place is not that expands? How is that? Right. It's definitely designed for a snow load. In fact, I think this winter we tested it. <laughs> um, the roofs were completed this winter. But it does have a taper. It certainly tapers to the point where it actually dips. And so it can hold. Um, I think we even have very specific regulations. And I'm going to say three and a half feet of snow on it. But it would never do it because the way the snow works is such a windy area that it actually converges to the low point. And at a certain point, beyond three and a half feet, feet, just like any other roof in the city, you actually have to kind of get up there and take it off. But um, it, it did work fairly effectively this uh, winter. Okay, one more. Are there really close to reefs now in Boston Harbor? And if there are, why cannot voices be produced in the harbor? There are, to the best of my knowledge, there are no oyster reefs in Boston Harbor. Uh, we are hoping to, we're starting to get to build them. We, we've got oysters, but it's a matter of critical mass. And also, oysters start off their lives as males, then they convert to females. They do kind of a boy George thing. And so, so they, uh, so the ones we are, have down are not, we're hoping this year we'll have some females in our population to be able to have a good mix. So it's not the pollution of uh, that they can't. No, you there's star with that? Have you had actually voices in the harbor at the same thing? My belief is we haven't uh, we haven't had enough adult oysters down long enough to really get to see that. But we're gonna be watching very carefully this year to see if we have small oysters that are this bad. So. so thank you very much to Dan and Andrew and Mimi for an excellent. Video.